tonight, police surround and detain the former president of Honduras. Juan Orlando Hernandez handed himself over, potentially facing extradition and drug charges here in the United States. Once one of the most powerful men in Central America, Hernandez stepped down less than a month ago. He says he plans to defend himself in accordance with the law. Ready to respond, President Biden addresses the nation with that message if Russia invades Ukraine. Concerns rising that a possible attack could happen at any time. And while Russia claims that it's pulling some of its troops back, new satellite images suggest soldiers are in a threatening position right now. Historic settlement and what has been seen as a rare victory for plaintiffs suing gun makers, a gun manufacturer settles claims in a mass shooting in the U.S. Now the massive multi-million dollar settlement with eight families of the victims of the Sandy Hook massacre while they continue to live with grief. When people say, well, nothing's been done since the Sandy Hook tragedy, I say, right. no, you're wrong about that. Right. You're very wrong about that. Yeah. Revisiting her words 50 years later, ABC News Live is talking with an iconic political activist who's looking back at her decades of advocacy and where we are now. I, I wouldn't change anything though, because I learned from my errors. I learned perhaps more from the mistakes that I made uh, than from the things I did uh, correctly the first time around. A long time debate finds renewed life in the Winter Games. Athletes with ties around the world left with a decision, which country will they represent? Our in-depth look at Olympic identities. I definitely feel as though I am just as American as I am Chinese. A bittersweet goodbye to an animated aardvark that grew up with the generations. The creator of Arthur talks to ABC News Live about how a book series turned TV show taught kids about the important life issues like bullying, body shaming, even the loss of a loved one. Being a child is not easy. You are navigating this world and you're not ready for these things that come to you. And maybe that's where Arthur comes in. Good evening, everyone. I'm Lindsay Davis. Thanks so much for streaming with us. We are tracking several major stories tonight, including a historic settlement by a gun manufacturer in connection with the mass shooting at Sandy Hook Elementary School. But we do begin tonight with President Biden's warning that despite mixed messages from Russia, an attack in Ukraine is a very real possibility. President Biden addressing not just the nation today from the White House, but the Russian people saying, we are not your enemy. Biden, though, making it very clear the U.S. will defend every inch of NATO territory with everything it has. Ukraine, however, is not a member of NATO. Today, Russia suggested it is pulling forces back. These are the images from the Russian Defense Ministry. They claim to show just that. But new satellite images from the past 48 hours actually reveal increased activity among the 150,000 Russian forces near the Ukrainian border. The president says if an invasion occurs, it will have consequences here in the U.S. and that defending democracy and liberty is never without a cost. Terry Morant leads us off once again tonight from Ukraine. Tonight, in plain, stark terms, President Biden warned that a Russian invasion of Ukraine is still a very real and very dire possibility. And this striking moment, the U.S. president speaking directly to the Russian people. To the citizens of Russia, you are not our enemy. And I do not believe you want a bloody, destructive war against Ukraine. Biden spoke a few hours after the Kremlin claimed some Russian troops are leaving their forward positions and returning to their bases after completing their military exercises. The Russian Defense Ministry releasing this video of tanks they say are being transported away from areas near Ukraine. We have not yet verified the Russian military units are returning to their home bases. ABC News has learned tonight that the U.S. government sees no evidence of a Russian withdrawal. In fact, the U.S. continues to see some Russian troops actually moving into forward firing positions. Those U.S. sources also believe that Vladimir Putin has told his military to be ready for action by tomorrow, but that it's still unclear if he has made a decision to invade Ukraine. And while Ukraine is not a NATO member, Biden with a clear message to Putin about any broader ambitions he might have. And make no mistake, the United States will defend every inch of NATO territory with the full force of American power. In Moscow, after meeting with Germany's leader today, Putin said he had decided to, quote, partially pull back troops, but he was cryptic about what lies ahead. How will Russia act next? According to plan, Putin declared. 
adding he did not consider the crisis over and that his security demands to bar Ukraine permanently from joining NATO and to roll back the alliance to 1997 positions had not been met by the West. But Putin did say again he was ready to continue on the negotiating track. New satellite images over the past 48 hours show increased Russian military activity among the 150,000 troops it has around Ukraine, from military exercises in Belarus to the north to the Black Sea south. Tonight, more U.S. troops are on their way to bolster NATO allies. Several hundred soldiers from the 101st Airborne Division in Fort Campbell, Kentucky, are deploying to Europe, part of a contingent of 3,000 troops announced last week. Ukrainians saying earlier today that they will believe it when they see it as far as a Russian de-escalation. Terry Moran joins us once again from Western Ukraine. Terry, we've already heard a response from Russia tonight to the president's speech. What are they saying? Uh, Lindsay, it was, it was a surprising response from the Kremlin, a sneering message of contempt. It's something President Biden said in his remarks. He said the United States is willing to pay a price to defend freedom. And the spokeswoman tonight for the Russian foreign ministry said, and I quote, I have never seen the United States pay any price to protect freedom. Even the bills have never been paid. That's the response. Quite a statement there. Terry Moran, our thanks to you. And now let's bring in ABC's chief White House correspondent, Cecilia Vega. Cecilia, the president warned Americans today on the impact of a Russian invasion. What did he and the White House have to say on as far as how this would be felt here in the U.S.? Yeah, Lindsay, and this was a really big deal because basically what President Biden is trying to do is to convey to Americans why they need to be invested in this crisis overseas in no uncertain terms. President Biden said there will be consequences here at home if Russia invades. He said this will not be painless. Now, just not long ago, I put this question to the White House. What is the worst case scenario that Americans should expect if this invasion happens? The press secretary telling me that energy prices could go up and that means that Americans will feel that at the pump. Now the White House, Lindsay, says that they're going to take every step they can to try to alleviate any pain if indeed this does happen, but they're not spelling out what exactly that means. And they were pushed today on whether the White House would support a gas tax holiday. That's something some Democrats have been, been pushing for to basically suspend the federal gas tax through the end of the year to give Americans Americans some relief at the pump, but the White House not signing on to that one at this point. We should note also, Lindsay, that because of all the tensions we have seen in recent weeks, we are already seeing prices rise at the pump. There is a direct connection to that. But, Lindsay, you heard the president say today right here, he said defending democracy and liberty is never without cost. All right, Cecilia Vega reporting in from the White House for us. Thanks so much, Cecilia. Now to the historic settlement by gunmaker Remington Arms, which has agreed to pay $73 million to some of the families of the Sandy Hook Elementary School shooting victims. It's the first settlement of its kind for a mass shooting. ABC's Janae Norman has the details. The landmark lawsuit settlement tonight. Gun manufacturer Remington Arms agreeing to pay a historic $73 million to families of nine victims of the Sandy Hook Elementary School shooting. Today is a day of accountability for an industry that has thus far enjoyed operating with immunity and impunity. Those families suing Remington, the maker of the Bushmaster semi-automatic rifle used in the shooting, accusing the company of unethically advertising a weapon meant for war to young men, including product placement in video games and ads like this one reading, consider your man card reissued. Remington had previously denied responsibility, but had no comment today. It was designed to kill quickly and efficiently. The Sandy Hook shooter helped fulfill that purpose, shooting 154 bullets in less than five minutes and killing 26 innocent people, including my six-year-old son. Today, more than nine years after that fateful morning, the pain is still raw. True justice would be our 15-year-old healthy and standing next to us right now. But Benny will never be 15. I sat down with Francine and David Wheeler, who said they joined the lawsuit feeling like they had to do something after losing their six-year-old son, Ben. Why did you decide, not knowing how long it would take, how painful it could be? It made sense to us as people to take part in this, to try to do something, to make it so that another dad doesn't have to stand here and deal with this. How could you not? take an opportunity like this to try and change something. 
we're not done being parents to Benjamin. No. Okay. Not by a long shot. And today is, a, is, 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 a, is an example of that. You never do stop being a parent. Janae Norman joins us now from Newtown, Connecticut. Janae, the Wheeler family told you that this is not about the money, but about change. And as part of that settlement, Remington agreed to release thousands of pages of internal documents. When will those documents be made public? And what have you learned about what's in them? Well, Lindsay, those documents were key. We're told that the families wouldn't settle without Remington agreeing to release those thousands of pages of internal documents. We're told it'll still be a couple of weeks before they are released, but the families say those documents show that Remington marketed their guns to get them in the hands of impressionable, violent, prone young men like the one who carried out the shooting at an elementary school here in Newtown. Lindsay. All right, Janae Norman reporting in from Connecticut. Thanks so much. Britain's Prince Andrew has reached an out-of-court settlement in a lawsuit accusing him of sexually abusing a woman when she was a minor after they were introduced by Jeffrey Epstein. In the deal, Andrew does not admit to any abuse but does promise a substantial donation to her charity supporting victims' rights. ABC's Ariel Reshef has this story. Tonight, that stunning about face from Prince Andrew settling out of court for an undisclosed amount with his accuser, Virginia Roberts Jufre, after years of denying her claims against him. Jufre, now 38, says Jeffrey Epstein and Glenn Maxwell trafficked her for sex with the prince on multiple occasions, starting when she was just 17. In a letter to the court filed by both sides, Andrew now saying he has never intended to malign Ms. Jufre's character and he accepts that she has suffered both as an established victim of abuse and as a result of unfair public attacks. The Queen's son also acknowledging it is known that Jeffrey Epstein trafficked countless young girls over many years and saying he regrets his association with Epstein. Do you remember her? No. A stark contrast from his disastrous interview with the BBC in 2019. Do you regret the whole friendship with Epstein? <laughs> um, I, now, I, I still not. And the reason being is that, that the, the people that I met um, and the opportunities that I was given to learn, um, either by him or because of him, were actually very useful. And while he does not admit to or deny ever assaulting or even meeting Jufre, he commends the bravery of Miss Jufre and other survivors in standing up for themselves and others. Lindsay, Buckingham Palace is not commenting, and the terms of that settlement are not public, but the letter says that Prince Andrew intends to make a substantial donation to Jufre's charities in support of victims' rights. Lindsay? Ariel, thank you. And next, we turn to a young girl who was reported missing more than two years ago. She was found alive today in upstate New York, more than 150 miles from where she initially disappeared, hidden in the home of her biological parents who had lost custody of her. Here's ABC's Stephanie Ramos. Tonight, police say they found six-year-old Paisley Schultes, who was missing for more than two years, in a house in Saugerties, New York, huddled in this cold, wet space under the stairs. One of my detectives uh, was walked up and down the steps a number of times uh, during this, the course of the search, and he said there was just something about the steps that was off. He used a flashlight, and where two of the step boards came together, uh, he looked through the crack, and he saw what he believed was a blanket. And eventually, they saw a pair of little feet, and when they got more boards off, they found the, the little girl, Paisley. Police say Paisley was four years old when she was abducted by her biological parents, who did not have custody. Police had been to the home before looking for Paisley, only to come up empty. But late Monday, a fresh tip. The child was being hidden in a secret location inside the residence. Police searching the home for more than an hour. Nobody was leaving without that child. They, we honestly believe that that child was there. And of course, at the end of the day, that's exactly what the case was. Both biological parents and Paisley's paternal grandfather were arrested. Police say Paisley is in good health and was reunited with her guardian and older sister. Lindsay. Stephanie, thank you. COVID-19 hospitalizations are on the decline, but experts say we are not out of the woods just yet as states continue to lift mask mandates. ABC's Zareen Shah has more. Tonight, schools turning into battlegrounds over masks, from protests across the country to arrests at this district meeting in New Hampshire. In Virginia, lawmakers voting to ban mask mandates in schools. In California, many parents eager to see those requirements dropped. 
I'm just ready to see my kids back in school without their masks. Frustration now boiling over at the ballot box. San Francisco today holding its first recall election in nearly 40 years. After parents launched a campaign to unseat three school board members, they accuse of failing to help reopen schools fast enough. Children who are disadvantaged have fallen far behind in their schooling, and you only get so much time to catch them up. Still other parents insist school board leaders did their best to protect vulnerable communities. I believe that they saved many, many lives by having the kids stay home a little bit longer. And tonight, a new CDC report reveals Omicron's impact on children. The rate of pediatric hospitalization was four times higher during Omicron than during the Delta surge. The biggest increase in kids under five who still cannot get the vaccine. Scene. The youngest among us still vulnerable. Our thanks to Zareen for that. And when we come back, the lawsuit now filed in the Russ shooting investigation. What lawyers hope to accomplish with this animated video creating what they say happened. Also, the consumer alert from an American automaker about cars spontaneously bursting into flames. What you need to know. And it might seem like an existential question, but what does a flag mean to you? Our in-depth report about the Olympians choosing which country to represent and the implications when that country is one of our main adversaries. With so much at stake, so much on the line, more Americans turn here than any place else. ABC News, World News Tonight with David Muir, America's number one most watched newscast, now streaming on ABC News Live. It was a scary time in the 70s. You had multiple bodies showing up in Los Angeles. There were so many murders happening. You had to have a name for it, serial killer. There was a human head in there. This was premeditated evil. You have this clock. This person is going to do this again. It's me against the killer. Who's going to win? We'll see who laughs last. Pat. What came next was unlike anything they had ever seen. Admit it. These days, what you need to know seems to change just about every day. What is it that you really want to know, need to know? To help you not just get through your day, but to make the most of it. Feel smarter. Feel better. Feel happier. Well, how about a third hour of Good Morning America? GMA 3, what you need to know. Now streaming on ABC News Live. It's all about you. I risk my life. I put my family in danger. If I was caught, they would have put a bullet in my head. But it was the right thing to do. It was the only thing to do. Terror plot foiled in Garden City, Kansas. That would have been one of the most deadly acts of domestic terrorism ever in the United States. It would have been Oklahoma City. He put his family himself in jeopardy for us. Take America's number one news with you anywhere you go, anytime, free. Download the ABC News app now. Breaking news, exclusives, 24-7. There for you with one touch. The ABC News app. Download it now. This is what being live is Three all tracking. about. This is ABC News Live. All right, we're going to move back. Let's move back. We're surrounded this by people no squeezing into this bomb shelter. We're on an urgent delivery run. With Not afraid to go there. So my question, Mr. President, what are you so afraid of? Breaking news, live events. This is the moment. Lift off. Oh, this is the moment. Streaming straight to you anytime, anywhere. You just met one friend right here. You're watching ABC News Live. Thanks for streaming with us. National parks are incredibly safe places. A crime will happen. Hey, my mom. My wife had fallen in really critical condition. At that time, I thought it was just a tragic accident. There's still a lot of questions we need to ask. There were small things that didn't totally add up. This is two lives for Harold that have died now. I was shocked. Something's not right. Welcome back. Now to Beijing and the challenging decisions some athletes who have their foot in not one but two countries have had to make. The question of which flag means the most to them and which country to compete for is especially difficult when talking about choosing between two geopolitical adversaries. Our Maggie Ruley has this report from Beijing about what motivates athletes to make this complex choice. 
The International Olympic Committee may say politics and sports don't mix, but despite their best efforts, some athletes are finding themselves in the crosshairs of a fraught relationship between the United States and China. After winning gold for Team USA with an electric performance in men's singles free skate, Utah native Nathan Chen is being slammed on Weibo, China's equivalent of Twitter, where users are labeling the Chinese American as a traitor for choosing to represent the United States. My mom grew up in Beijing, she was born and raised in Beijing, spent a good portion of her early life in Beijing. It's just amazing to be able to look back on all of that and we were able to make it here and I was able to have this experience where she grew up. When California-born Eileen Gu flew into the air, spinning and flipping her way to a gold medal win in big air aerial freestyle skiing, she took the podium for the Chinese Olympic team. Despite years of training and competing in the United States, Gu is here representing China, her mother's homeland instead. Eileen Gu is an exception, and that's the reason she's getting all of this attention. You know, she is world level. She was world level when she decided to represent China. Gu says she made the decision when she was 15, wanting to represent her family and inspire young women in China to get into sports. Writing on Instagram in 2019, this was an incredibly tough decision for me to make. I am proud of my heritage and equally proud of my American upbringings. The opportunity to help inspire millions of young people where my mom was born during the 2022 Beijing Olympic Winter Games is a once in a lifetime opportunity to help promote the sport I love. Eileen Gu has really changed everything because it's China. There's tensions between the US and China. I think this is taken as a symbol of more than just sports. It's taken as a symbol of a rising China that can threaten the U.S. Gu's choice to wear China's colors playing out as the U.S. and 11 other countries stand firm with a diplomatic boycott of the Winter Games, citing China's human rights record, including what the U.S. has called a genocide against Uyghurs, a Muslim minority group. Already a star in China, the gold medalist has been thrust into superstardom, her face plastered on billboards across the country, local media often calling her the snow princess. Fans, or maybe once fans, were accusing her of allowing herself to be used as a political tool by the Chinese government to doing this for financial gain and then for supporting a country with a really questionable human rights history, for supporting a country that is waging a genocide. Gu addressing criticism for competing for the host nation and refusing to say whether she is still a U.S. citizen. China does not allow dual citizenship under any circumstances. I definitely feel as though I am just as American as I am Chinese. I have been very outspoken about my gratitude to both the U.S. and China for making me the person who I am. My mission is to use sport as a force for unity. I'm not trying to keep anyone happy. I'm an 18-year-old girl out here living my best life. That culture clash also playing out on social media for Gu. A user commenting on her Instagram, asking her to speak up for those millions who don't have internet freedom. In response, Gu writing, anyone can download a VPN. It's literally free on the App Store. VPN's a way to get around internet censorship. And many were quick to point out they're illegal in China. Gu's high-profile citizenship swap may be gaining her international attention and scrutiny. But not every athlete's facing geopolitical tensions when changing countries. Citizenship switching has gone on as long as the Olympic Games have existed, but it has it has really been ramping up worldwide in the last couple of decades. Some athletes switch countries because they'll have a better chance at making the Olympic team or to get access to new opportunities. New York native Sarah Escobar is representing Ecuador in women's alpine skiing, becoming the first female winter athlete to do so in the country's history. 2014 silver medalist and three-time Olympian Gus Kenworthy, born in England but spending most of his life in Colorado, deciding to represent Great Britain for the first time in these games to honor his dual heritage. Many athletes like Kenworthy, who compete under different flags, say there's a constant struggle of balancing their cultural identity. And also to show off your jacket for a second, because yeah. you, get, you get an Armani jacket now. That's yeah, ridiculous. That's pretty cool. <laughs> Louis Vito III snowboarded for the U.S. in 2010, nabbing a fifth place finish and winning a place in America's heart, going for a spin on Dancing with the Stars the year before. But this year, he hit the half pipe for Italy. We were there to see him land front side double corks and mid twists, finishing in 13th. Catching up with him a few days later, he's all smiles in that red, white, and green jacket. If you know an Italian American, then you know they're Italian American because they like to let you know and they're very proud. It started as kind of a fun thing that my dad and I would talk about, like first getting your citizenship because his mother's from Italy, but 
uh, then it kind of morphed into how cool would it be to do that, to be able to compete for the U.S. and for Italy. His family back in Italy watching him represent the country with pride. My godfather cried when we, when we told them. So, I mean, it's just, it's so much deeper. Have you gotten any hate from people in America? Yeah, I mean, of course, but it's, it's just like, okay, A, you don't know snowboarding. B, you don't know me and you don't know the reason. I'm super prideful of being American. I'm super prideful of now being, you know, a dual citizen and obviously uh, being Italian-American. The whole thing was just doing it for myself and for my family, and it's been a long road, but to go to two Olympics and still be standing and still be competitive is, is a dream come true. Vito says while spectators may notice the flag switch, when it comes to the half pipe, they're all teammates, and he's still friends with the guys in America he trained with for years. It doesn't matter what flag's next to your name, where you're born, it doesn't matter. Everyone wants to have a good time, push each other, and, and just do what we love to do. Athletes like Vito, Chen, and Gu might be more focused on competing and the endorsement deals that come along with glory. But representation does matter, especially when an athlete chooses to compete for an adversary. It's not unusual for an athlete to make the decision to compete for another country. I think if Eileen had made the decision to compete for a different country, we might not be here having the same conversation. As globalization brings us all closer together, more and more athletes make it to choose which flag means the most to them. The world is becoming much more interconnected and international sports are really kind of a, a bellwether of that. This transnational flow of athletes has been ramping up and, and should continue to do so unless hit heads of state decide to clamp down on it. Our thanks to Maggie Ruley for that. Still ahead here on Prime, the move by former President Trump's accounting firm. Why the company says some of the Trump Organization's financial disclosures simply cannot be relied upon. Also, the mysterious photo from Mars. What does NASA think this shows? And back here on Earth, the water is rising, the Earth is drying up. We go by the numbers about just how bad the California drought is and how soon parts of the country could be underwater. But first, our tweet of the day, gymnast Simone Biles sharing the news. News. She is now engaged. It was an extraordinary story. A computer salesman was supposed to report to prison to begin a 17 year sentence. They let him turn himself into jail with no escort. No one thought he would run. How do you evade capture for 25 years? How do you do that? Now, join the search, following the U.S. Marshals as they uncover new leads in a global manhunt. Can you help catch this fugitive? Have you seen this man? Have you seen this man? Have you seen this man? Listen and join the all-new hunt wherever you get your podcasts. It was a scary time. In the 70s, you had multiple bodies showing up in Los Angeles. There were so many murders happening. You had to have a name for it. Serial killer. There was a human head in there. This was premeditated evil. We have this clock. This person is going to do this again. It's me against the killer. Who's going to win? We'll see who laughs last. Pat. What came next was unlike anything they had ever seen. World News Now. And America This Morning. The best new video. <laughs> Breaking news overnight. Your money and concerns about inflation. The pandemic is not over. The stories people are talking about. You don't want to shave your legs? Don't. I was going to say. And what to expect in the day ahead. From the top of the world, baby! ABC World News Now and America This Morning. Weekday morning starting at 2 a.m. Eastern. Up all night to keep you up to date. Right now, with so much at stake, Sunday mornings, this is the place. Taking on all the tough questions, straightforward reporting, no spin, no hype, no bull. Thank you for making ABC's This Week with George Stephanopoulos, the number one Sunday morning news show versus the competition. Welcome to This Week. Live is all about. This is ABC News Live. 
right, we're gonna move back. Let's move back. We're surrounded by building. people we're squeezing into this bomb shelter. We're on an urgent delivery run. With Not them. afraid to go there. So my question, Mr. President, what are you so afraid of? Breaking news, live events. This is the moment. Lift off. <laughs> Streaming straight to you, anytime, anywhere. You just met one friend right here. You're watching ABC News Live. Thanks for streaming with us. Welcome back, everyone. Now to some dire environmental news. Today, NOAA released a report finding that U.S. coastlines will experience a profound sea level rise by 2050. This comes just one day after another report was published finding that the southwest United States is now experiencing the driest conditions in more than a thousand years. We take a look by the numbers. Scientists now predict that sea levels surrounding the U.S. will rise an additional 10 to 12 inches by 2050. That's a century's worth of sea level rise in less than 30 years, according According to NOAA, rising sea levels will intensify storm surges, high tides, coastal erosion, and wetland loss. The report reads, quote, by 2050, moderate flooding, which is typically disruptive and damaging by today's weather, sea level, and infrastructure standards, is expected to occur more than 10 times as often as it does today. Also this week, a study published in Nature Climate Change found that two decades of drought in the southwest has created the driest conditions in more than 1,200 years. The study analyzed tree ring patterns, which gives us insight about soil moisture. Since the year 2000, the average soil moisture deficit has been two times as severe as any drought of the 1900s. And human-caused climate change, the study says, is responsible for about 42 percent of that soil moisture deficit over the past two decades. And we still have lots to get to here on Prime tonight. Our conversation with author Angela Davis about the re-release of her transformational and revolutionary work, The Lessons We Can Still Learn All the years later. Also, we now know who will host the Oscars coming up, the excitement over the tag team effort, and believe in yourself. We are celebrating that wonderful message from the popular kids show, Arthur, which after decades on the air is coming to an end this week. But first, a look at our top trending stories on abcnews.com. Time, anytime, Nightline. It was an extraordinary story. A computer salesman was supposed to report to prison to begin a 17-year sentence. They let him turn himself into jail with no escort. No one thought he would run. How do you evade capture for 25 years? How do you do that? Now, join the search, following the U.S. Marshals as they uncover new leads in a global manhunt. Can you help catch this fugitive? Have you seen this man? Have you seen this man? Have you seen this man? Listen and join the all-new hunt wherever you get your podcasts. Now streaming on ABC News Live 2020. True crime, cinematic, real-life drama, stunning, the unthinkable. Follow the clues. The Hunt. True crime. 2020. Now streaming on ABC News Live. National parks are incredibly safe places. A crime will happen. Hey, my mom. My wife had fallen in really critical condition. At that time, I thought it was just a tragic accident. There's still a lot of questions we need to ask. There were small things that didn't totally add up. This is two lives for Harold that have died now. I was shocked. Something's not right. Admit it. These days, what you need to know seems to change just about every day. What is it that you really want to know, need to know? To help you not just get through your day, but to make the most of it. Feel smarter. Feel better. Feel happier. Well, how about a third hour of Good Morning America? GMA 3, what you need to know. Now streaming on ABC News Live. It's all about you. I know what happened, and I'm not guilty. Why the fascination with criminal trials? Figure out what's really out there. She revealed she had murdered his family. I know in my heart that he did this. It's the time of suspicion. The ending's really tough. You don't know whether truth is going to be difficult to find unless you try to find it. Is what being live is all about. This is ABC News Live. 
Alright, we're gonna move out. Let's move out. We're surrounded this by people no squeezing into this bomb shelter. We're on an urgent delivery run with not afraid to go there. So my question, Mr. President, what are you so afraid of? Breaking news, live events. This is the moment. Let's go. <laughs> Streaming straight to you. Anytime, anywhere. You just met one friend right here. You're watching ABC News Live. Thanks for streaming with us. The landmark lawsuit settlement tonight. Gun manufacturer Remington Arms agreeing to pay a historic $73 million to families of nine victims of the Sandy Hook Elementary School shooting. Today is a day of accountability for an industry that has thus far enjoyed operating with immunity and impunity. Those families suing Remington, the maker of the Bushmaster semi-automatic rifle used in the shooting, accusing the company of unethically advertising a weapon meant for war to young men, including product placement in video games and ads like this one reading, consider your man card reissued. Remington had previously denied responsibility, but had no comment today. It was designed to kill quickly and efficiently. The Sandy Hook shooter helped fulfill that purpose, shooting 154 bullets in less than five minutes and killing 26 innocent people, including my six-year-old son. A major new development in the investigations into former President Trump's business practices. His longtime accounting firm, Mazars USA, cutting ties with the Trump Organization. In a letter filed in court by the New York Attorney General, the firm said a decade of financial statements compiled with information provided by the Trump Organization should no longer be relied upon. Trump used those statements to secure loans and to tout his business savvy during his presidential campaign. I was a business guy. I was a Successful. I was very successful. In a statement, the Trump Organization downplayed Mazar's decision, but it could impact the company's ongoing business. Chrysler issuing a fire warning for some of its hybrid minivans. The company recalling 2017 and 2018 Pacifica hybrid minivans following a dozen reports of vehicles catching fire while parked. Some were charging at the time. Chrysler trying to determine the cause of the fires. Owners should not plug in their vehicles until a fix is available. Tennis superstar Novak Djokovic announcing he will opt out of the upcoming French Open and Wimbledon if it means having to change his stance on the COVID-19 vaccine. That is the price that I'm willing to pay. The 20-time Grand Slam winner faced a firestorm in Australia last month after he arrived to play in the Australian Open without being vaccinated. The government canceled his visa, forcing him out of the tournament. The world's number one player opened up about that experience to the BBC in his first interview since he left Australia. Australia. I understand that uh, and support fully uh, the freedom to choose, you know, whether you want to get vaccinated or not. Boycotting two of the year's biggest tournaments could wind up costing Djokovic the title of greatest men's player of all time. Yes, he exhibited some temper. Why? Because he wanted the win. But he says that is a price he is willing to pay. Because the principles of uh, decision making on my body. Uh, are more important than any title or anything else. I'm not sure who thought this was a good idea, but I am hosting the Oscars along with my good friend Wanda Sykes and Regina Hall. I better go watch some movies. Regina, Amy, Wanda making history. The first time three women have ever been named the hosts of Hollywood's Biggest Night. In recent weeks, there were questions about whether or not the show would even have a host this year at all. And congratulations to all of you. You made it. We're at the Oscars. Last emceed by Jimmy Kimmel in 2018, the show has been without a host ever since. And while we don't know much about the show itself, we do know with these three women, anything can happen. Now to the latest developments in the Russ shooting. Nearly four months after that deadly incident on the movie set, the family for Helena Hutchins has filed a wrongful death lawsuit. And tonight they're making some serious claims about actor Alec Baldwin and the liability that he has for this deadly incident. Joining us now is our Kaylee Hartung, who has covered this story for us every step of the way. Kaylee, thanks so much for joining us tonight. First, walk us through the particulars of this lawsuit filed today. 
Yeah, Lindsay, this filing is really sparing no one. They're naming several crew members, cast members, even producers, and clearly putting the focus on Alec Baldwin. The Hutchins family attorney today saying there are many people culpable here, but Mr. Baldwin was the person holding the weapon that, but if for him not shooting it, she would not have died. So clearly they say he has a significant portion of the liability here. When it goes to the claims against Baldwin, they say he failed to use a rubber, a prop, or a replica gun in a moment when he was in such close proximity to the crew and that he also failed to receive the revolver from the armor or in the presence of the armor and that he even refused gun training they say for that cross draw maneuver that he was supposed to be depicting in that particular scene now according to the filing they say the defendants here had the power to prevent Helena's death and they say that they utilized aggressive cost-cutting practices that jeopardized and endangered the safety of the cast and crew there. All in all, they say the defendants disregarded at least 15 industry standard safety practices. And there's no figure listed in this complaint, Lindsay. They say the damages here are, substan are substantial. That will be left up to the people of New Mexico to determine. And, and the attorney said they expect to be in trial a year and a half to two years from now. But there is a recognition with the criminal suit, the potential for it, that this could all be prolonged even farther. Lindsay. And, and Kaylee, many tonight are talking about some dramatic animated video released by the lawyers. What are they hoping to accomplish with that? Yeah, Lindsay, this video was dramatic, this animated recreation of what happened in that church. For the past four months, we've all been trying to piece together from affidavits, from interviews with people who were inside the church, and of course, what Alec Baldwin has said to ABC News. But these attorneys have conducted their own investigation and pieced together what they believe happened inside that church. So you see the assistant director, Dave Hulls, handing the revolver to Alec Baldwin. You'll remember there have been questions of who actually handed him the gun. And again, Dave Hulls not checking the gun. There were so many questions about who checked the gun, when and how. Then you see just how close in proximity Baldwin was to the crew members, including Helena Hutchins. The attorneys say it was just about four feet. Again, this is all to make the point that if that gun had not been in Alec Baldwin's hands and gone off, that Helena Hutchins would still be alive. Lindsay, you can see the case that these attorneys are trying to lay out as they want to hold a lot of people accountable here. And what's the latest in the criminal investigation into just what happened? Yeah, so right now, Lindsay, what we know, the FBI has has the lead on this investigation in this particular moment because they have the gun they have all of the ammunition that was found on the set so they are conducting ballistics analysis in quantico and until they can get that information back to the sheriff's department to wrap everything up the da can't even begin to determine if she is going to look into criminal charges here so again a long road ahead still in understanding what went wrong on the set of russ lindsay yeah, potentially years it sounds like going forward kaylee hartung our thanks to you and we do want to add tonight in a statement to ABC News, Alec Baldwin's attorney says any claim that Alec was reckless is entirely false. Actors should be able to rely on armorers and prop department professionals as well as assistant directors rather than deciding on their own when a gun is safe to use. Now to a political activist who has been at the forefront of black liberation, feminist, queer, and prison abolitionist movements for nearly five decades. Angela Davis is re-releasing Angela Davis, an autobiography, which was first published and edited by Toni Morrison back in 1974 with new passages documenting the aftermath of the Black Lives Matter movement. Re-released just today, we take a look back at her transformational and revolutionary work from growing up in the South, being the only woman, being the only black woman in college to her time in the Black Panther Party and being on the FBI's list of most wanted fugitives. Her footprint has paved the way for so many activists transforming movements of their own today. Miss Angela Davis, welcome to the show. Thank you. Thank you very much for inviting me. So revisiting your story after nearly 50 years, what advice would you have given yourself when you first sat down to bear it all at just 28 years old during the height of the Black Liberation Movement? Well, there's a great deal of advice I might have given my uh, younger self, um, but that advice would be based precisely on uh, the history that has since unfolded. Uh, so 
um, I suppose I would say I, I wouldn't change anything oh. because I learned from my errors. I learned perhaps more from the mistakes that I made uh, than from the things I did uh, correctly the first time around. And for the many young generations just picking up their signs, marching the streets for change, they're taking on a new identity that you're a bit familiar with, being an activist. What advice would you give to new activists involved in, in transformative movements today? Uh, well, first of all, I am so excited about this new surge of youth activism. Uh, and perhaps I would uh, tell them uh, to remember that uh, they are not only attempting to achieve tangible goals, the loosening, for example, of the whole of structural racism on our institutions and our ideas, but I would say to them that you are also forging legacies of struggle that will be taken up by generations following you. Are you surprised with where we are? Do you feel like we've made more progress than you would have thought back then? Less progress? Oh, we've made much less progress much less progress than I would have imagined then. Uh, uh, I was one of those young activists who was absolutely convinced that uh, we were about to make a revolution that would not only disestablish racist uh, structures, but that would, would also uh, bring about the end of uh, capitalism. Uh, um, we have not moved very far in that direction. But what I am impressed about is that we have a much deeper understanding of what we are confronting. The world once chanted Free Angela, a movement that certainly sparked rage and demanded freedom for, for not only you, but for all political prisoners. You write in the 2021 preface, I must confess that I do not really know whether my interests in the intersection of race and feminism would not have developed in the way that they did if I had not been incarcerated at that crucial period. What memories would you say during that time really defined how you approach such revolutionary movements? Well, you know, before I was arrested, I had not really given very much thought to what was then referred to as the women's liberation movement. And I would say that I wrongly considered issues raised by the new women's movement as irrelevant to those of us who were struggling for revolutionary change. So I think I had a tendency to see the women's movement as a move toward assimilation. Uh, um, but at the same time, women in... Uh, the black movement and in uh, you know various uh, uh, radical movements at that time, the uh, Latino movement, uh, 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 Native American movements, women were sub subjected to many forms of um, what you might call patriarchal erasure. Uh, I think today uh, we have a much more intersectional uh, vision of what it means to engage in a struggle for a better world. And I want to go to a clip in the documentary called The Black Power Mixtape, where someone asks you about violence and revolution. Let's take a listen. I just, uh, I just find it incredible. It, because it, what it means is that the person who's asking that question has absolutely no idea what black people have gone through, what black people have experienced in this country since the time the first black person was kidnapped from the shores of Africa. That statement still so strong today. Do you think that it's possible to change the racial disparity that many black people feel that they still face in the criminal justice system today? Well, I think it is possible to bring about change, uh, yes. Um, but as, uh, as an abolitionist, I think in order to bring about that change, we're going to have to um, uh, recognize that uh, uh, the carceral system, the prison system, the police, are not the guarantors of security uh, for anyone, and that we will have to look for other modes of, 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 of guaranteeing safety and security. And so we want to abolish the prison. We want to abolish policing uh, as it stands, as um, one of the most dramatic examples of what we now call structural racism. Angela Davis, we thank you so much for joining us tonight. And everyone, you can get her book, Angela Davis, an autobiography, wherever books are sold. 
And finally tonight, it is the end of an era for a children's show that so many have long enjoyed, whether growing up or showing it to their own children. Its key message is one that can resonate with us all. Believe in yourself. Our Gio Benita has got a chance to sit down with the man behind the popular show, Arthur, as it ends its run after 25 years. It's been said, do what you love and you'll never work a day in your life. Hard work here is like Arthur. I think of kids as my boss. I remember being six years old and watching my dad go to work on the railroad and he hated his job. And it made such an impression on me. I, and I said to myself, at six, I want a job that I love. And if I could share a piece of advice with kids, it would be find something that you love to do and make that your job. For children's author Mark Brown, it's the end of an era. After 25 years, four Emmys, and a Peabody, there will be no more new episodes of the longest-running kids animated series in history, Arthur. The popular PBS children's television show follows an eight-year-old aardvark navigating through life's biggest lessons with his friends teaching empathy and inclusion. It's featured guests like Yo-Yo Ma and Michelle Kwan. Lace them up. How did you come up with Arthur? My son was three years old, Tolan, and he asked for a bedtime story. And I realized that the story was about an aardvark who was unhappy with his nose. So Arthur was born that night. Brown, a kid from Erie, Pennsylvania, used memories from his childhood to come up with Arthur, incorporating his own family members into the story, like his three sisters, who he combined into one girl to become Arthur's spunky sister, D.W. The stick from the park where you promised to take me today! Are you Arthur? Yeah, maybe. <laughs> yeah, there's a, there's a picture of me in third grade next to a picture of Arthur in third grade. There is a similarity. A newscaster asked a great question um, several years ago in Chicago. She said, could you describe Arthur in just a few words? And I said, okay, he's an eight-year-old aardvark who is navigating the mud puddles of life. And he doesn't always do it really well, but what eight-year-old does? Over the past 45 years, Arthur has gone through many changes. The little series going from selling 5 million books to a whopping 70 million. The show being a large part of Arthur's success, spawning many popular memes, with celebrities like Christy Teigen and John Legend getting in on the fun. Arthur! Who's Arthur? <laughs> It's a show that's touched many generations, dealing with difficult issues like bullying, body shaming, and even death. Brown never strayed away from giving what he felt children need most, the truth, revealing in 2019 that Arthur's third grade teacher is gay in the episode, Mr. Ratburn and a Special Someone. Who's getting married? Heck. Me. Although the response was overwhelmingly positive, Alabama Public Television refused to broadcast it. You know, art should reflect life, and there's no reason why we have to marginalize or not represent all of us. We're all in this big, wonderful mess together. Brown spent the past year writing one last book to go along with the show's end, titling it Believe in Yourself, after the show's famous theme song and most important lesson. It's a bittersweet end for his son Tolan, the inspiration behind Arthur, who he considers to be somewhat of a sibling. I mean, it was, it was born out of... Um, personal stories, and then it kind of started to evolve as the characters, um, you know, grew into themselves. Authenticity was always the, the focus. It had to be a, a story that rang true. Being a child is not easy. You are navigating this world, and you're not ready for these things that come to you. And maybe that's where Arthur comes in. You know, I had a wonderful friend in Fred Rogers who taught us all so much about how we could use television to be helpful to kids. And he said, you know, Mark, 
every child needs just one person in their life to believe in them to make it. My name is Christopher Warte, and I'm a second grade teacher here at Sanderson Walpack Elementary School. Chris grew up on Earth. He's now 34 and shares his love for the books with his second grade class. I think the biggest thing that I learned from Arthur growing up is understanding or realizing that other people have the same questions and are going through the same things in their life that I am, that I'm not alone. When I visit schools, I think about teachers and how probably so often they are that one person in a child's life who sees that potential and encourages them. And so I, I think of teachers as my heroes, and I, I think we don't give them the credit that they're due so often. What about the books? Will the books keep going? And when I wrote Believe in Yourself, I thought, OK, this could be it. It's probably the closest I'll come to a memoir, because I got to write about my life growing up and what it's like to do books and television and share that with the reader. Um, but I guess I shouldn't close the door completely. We hope not. Navigating the mud puddles of life, something that many of us have in common with Arthur. Our thanks to Gio for that. And before we go tonight, the image of the day from a planet not so far away. The Mars Curiosity rover captured this image of a wind-carved rock that looks a little like a red beach whale on the Martian surface, showing the beautiful and unique shapes that can be created by years of wind and erosion. And that is our show for this hour. Be sure to stay tuned to ABC News Live for more context and analysis of the day's top stories. Thanks so much for streaming with us. Coming up in the next hour, we're staying on top of a few things. Our conversation with the seventh grader handcuffed and placed in juvenile detention for two weeks for a crime she says she did not commit. And the major cross-country storm bringing snow, ice, and severe weather to millions, the areas that need to be on high alert. Americans choose ABC News, America's number one news source. This is what being live is all about. This is ABC News Live. All right, we're going to move back. Let's move back. We're surrounded by people squeezing into this bomb shelter. We're on an urgent delivery run. With Not afraid to go there. So my question, Mr. President, what are you so afraid of? Breaking news, live events. This is the moment. Lift off. Okay. Streaming straight to you, anytime, anywhere. You just met one friend right here. You're watching ABC News Live. Thanks for streaming with us. Admit it. These days, what you need to know seems to change just about every day. What is it that you really want to know, need to know? To help you not just get through your day, but to make the most of it. Feel smarter. Feel better. Feel happier. Well, how about a third hour of Good Morning America? GMA 3, what you need to know. Now streaming on ABC News Live. It's all about you. Take America's number one news with you anywhere you go, anytime, free. Download the ABC News app now. Breaking news, exclusives, 24-7. There for you with one touch. The ABC News app. Download it now. It was a scary time. In the 70s, you had multiple bodies showing up in Los Angeles. There were so many murders happening. You had to have a name for it. Serial killer. There was a human head in there. This was premeditated evil. You have this clock. This person is going to do this again. It's me against the killer. Who's going to win? We'll see who laughs last. Pat. What came next was unlike anything they had ever seen.
ABC News. Honored. Winner of nine Edward R. Murrow Awards. More than any other network, including winning for the third straight year the award for overall excellence in television. ABC News is America's number one news source. With so much at stake, more Americans turn here than any other newscast. ABC News, World News Tonight with David Muir. America's number one newscast and the number one program on television. Hey there, I'm Lindsay Davis. Thanks so much for streaming with us. We're monitoring several developments here at ABC News at this hour. A woman of mixed race in New York appears to be the third person to ever be cured of HIV. Doctors used a new transplant method involving umbilical cord blood, and scientists believe that this could open up the possibility of curing more people of diverse racial backgrounds. A cross-country storm is making its way from the Rockies to the east. The system is expected to bring with it snow, ice, and heavy rain and flooding from Texas to the Great Lakes as early as tomorrow night. The storm will hit the east Thursday night. Some scary moments for passengers on board this American Airlines flight in New York. The plane blew two tires during takeoff from JFK heading for Phoenix, the jet was able to stop safely on the runway. All 142 on board were okay and transferred to another plane. Now to the tense situation in Ukraine. Late today, President Biden spoke directly to the American people, saying that a Russian attack on Ukraine remains a very real possibility. Meanwhile, Russian officials are saying that they've pulled some troops back from the border. Still, U.S. officials remain skeptical, and Biden made clear today that we have seen no proof of a retreat. Here's ABC's Terry Moran reporting once again from Western Ukraine. Tonight, in plain, stark terms, President Biden warned that a Russian invasion of Ukraine is still a very real and very dire possibility. And this striking moment, the U.S. president speaking directly to the Russian people. To the citizens of Russia, you are not our enemy. And I do not believe you want a bloody, destructive war against Ukraine. Biden spoke a few hours after the Kremlin claimed some Russian troops are leaving their forward positions and returning to their bases after completing their military exercises. The Russian Defense Ministry releasing this video of tanks they say are being transported away from areas near Ukraine. We have not yet verified the Russian military units are returning to their home bases. ABC News has learned tonight that the U.S. government sees no evidence of a Russian withdrawal. In fact, the U.S. continues to see some Russian troops actually moving into forward firing positions. Those U.S. sources also believe that Vladimir Putin has told his military to be ready for action by tomorrow, but that it's still unclear if he has made a decision to invade Ukraine. And while Ukraine is not a NATO member, Biden with a clear message to Putin about any broader ambitions he might have. And make no mistake, the United States will defend every inch of NATO territory with the full force of American power. In Moscow, after meeting with Germany's leader today, Putin said he had decided to, quote, partially pull back troops, but he was cryptic about what lies ahead. Poplan. How will Russia act next? According to plan, Putin declared, adding he did not consider the crisis over and that his security demands to bar Ukraine permanently from joining NATO and to roll back the alliance to 1997 positions had not been met by the West. But Putin did say again he was ready to continue on the negotiating track. New satellite images over the past 48 hours show increased Russian military activity among the 150,000 troops it has around Ukraine, from military exercises in Belarus to the north to the Black Sea south. Tonight, more U.S. troops are on their way to bolster NATO allies. Several hundred soldiers from the 101st Airborne Division in Fort Campbell, Kentucky, are deploying to Europe, part of a contingent of 3,000 troops announced last week. Our thanks to Terry for that. And now let's bring in our chief global affairs correspondent, Martha Raditz. Martha, the warnings about what could happen if Putin launches a full-scale invasion are certainly grim. Explain what this could really look like. Well, the U.S. believes it would begin with electronic warfare, aerial bombardment on critical infrastructure in Ukraine, this followed by Russian special operations forces entering Kyiv to decapitate the Ukrainian government with plans to complete the operation in 24 to 72 hours. But even with 150,000 Russian troops, this would not be easy. They would face powerful resistance. This would be bloody and costly with potentially thousands and thousands 
thousands of casualties, both military and civilian. As President Biden said, there would be an immense human cost. Lindsay? Okay, Martha Raddatz, our thanks to you. Now to the historic settlement by gunmaker Remington Arms, which has agreed to pay $73 million to some of the families of the Sandy Hook Elementary School shooting victims. It's the first settlement of its kind for a mass shooting. ABC's Janae Norman has the details. The landmark lawsuit settlement tonight. Gun manufacturer Remington Arms agreeing to pay a historic $73 million to families of nine victims of the Sandy Hook Elementary School shooting. Today is a day of accountability for an industry that has thus far enjoyed operating with immunity and impunity. Those families suing Remington, the maker of the Bushmaster semi-automatic rifle used in the shooting, accusing the company of unethically advertising a weapon meant for war to young men, including product placement in video games and ads like this one reading, consider your man card reissued. Remington had previously denied responsibility, but had no comment today. It was designed to kill quickly and efficiently. The Sandy Hook shooter helped fulfill that purpose, shooting 154 bullets in less than five minutes and killing 26 innocent people, including my six-year-old son. Today, more than nine years after that fateful morning, the pain is still raw. True justice would be our 15-year-old healthy and standing next to us right now. But Benny will never be 15. I sat down with Francine and David Wheeler, who said they joined the lawsuit feeling like they had to do something after losing their six-year-old son, Ben. Why did you decide, not knowing how long it would take, how painful it could be? It made sense to us as people to take part in this, to try to do something, to make it so that another dad doesn't have to stand here and deal with this. How could you not? take an opportunity like this to try and change something. We're not done being parents to Benjamin. No, okay. not by a long shot. And today is, a, is, 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 a, is an example of that. Our thanks to Janae, never do stop being parents. And now to Beijing, the Russian ice skater at the center of controversy has skated her way to first place in the singles competition. The 15 year old tested positive for a banned substance. Now she says it was all a mix up with her grandfather's medication. ABC's Marcus Moore explains. Tonight, Russian figure skater Kamila Valieva landing first place in the women's short program. As we learned from one Olympic official, how the team's lawyers explained that December positive doping test. The official revealing that in an international court hearing, Valieva blamed the failed test on a mix-up with her grandfather's heart medication. Her argument was this uh, contamination which uh, uh, happened with a product uh, her grandfather was taking. And tonight, the New York Times, which says it reviewed documents from the court hearing, reporting that the lab testing Valieva's sample, quote, also found evidence of two other heart medications, hypoxin and L-carnitine. The Times saying neither of those substances are banned and that Valieva's mother said her daughter was taking hypoxin because of heart variations. The highly anticipated women's single competition now playing out amid backlash after that court ruled in favor of Valieva skating, even though she tested positive for the banned heart drug trimetazidine, which can boost endurance. Tonight, the International Olympic Committee defending its decision not to hold a medal ceremony if Valieva places in the top three until after the investigation is over. We respect uh, also the, the disappointment of the athlete, but uh, we had to balance the two things. That investigation could take a while. Marcus joins us now. And hey, Marcus, when is the next time that Camila Valieva competes? She is expected to take the ice uh, again on Thursday, Lindsay, for the, the free skate event. And that's an event she's widely expected to win. And she told a Russian TV station, a uh, Russian news outlet, I should say, that um, she, these last few days have been very difficult for her. Uh, but she was happy to perform. And Lindsay, overnight I watched her take the ice and her performance was nearly flawless. Lindsay. All right. Marcus Moore for us in Beijing. Thanks so much, Marcus.
We turn now to a wrongful arrest of a 13-year-old girl in Broward County, Florida. Last November, 7th grade Nia Wims was placed in handcuffs outside of her home after she was accused of posting a bomb threat against her school on Instagram. She spent 14 days in juvenile detention for a crime police now say she did not commit. The Pembroke Pines Police Department says that after further investigation, they now believe another student maliciously impersonated Nia to create an email address that she used to open multiple Instagram accounts from which she sent the threats. Nia's family is now suing the school, the police department, and Instagram. And we're joined tonight by Nia, her mom, Leslie Ann Davis, and their attorney, Marwan Porter. Thank you all so much for joining us tonight. Uh, Nia, I'd like to start with you. Uh, we can only imagine that what you went through must have been just horrific. You're just in the seventh grade. What were you thinking as they put those handcuffs on you? First, I felt really lost about the situation. It was a terrifying experience. And and what were your what was your mom saying at that point? Or Leslie Ann, I guess I'll, I'll just ask you directly in that moment what you were feeling. Um. Well, I asked before. I said, "Are you sure it's her?" And how do you know? And they said, "Yes." They checked the um the IP, and it led back to her iCloud. Um. I, you know, I was. It was, I was saddened by the situation. Even though I'm hurt, um, if she did it, I would love for her to be disciplined. Um, you know, in, some, in a form of way that a child should be disciplined. And at what point did you say, no, this isn't, this isn't right and, and I need to get a lawyer? I said it got very exhausting and she kept sticking to the, that she didn't do it. So that's when I decided to call a lawyer. MR1, let's bring you in here. Is this something that's common these days? Kids, kids making these fake accounts. What did you think when you initially heard about this case? Well, you know, I was, I was outraged. Um, you know, I think that when it comes to our children, law enforcement and our school officials must make sure they do their homework before they put our kids in handcuffs. And we know that, yes, there has been situations that have ended in you know, tragedy uh, where these type of threats need to be taken seriously, but it cannot become, it cannot come at the expense of our children. And Marwan, what do parents do in a, in a situation uh, like this where Leslie Ann was, was dealing with Nia saying she didn't do it, the police saying that she did, and meanwhile, you know, 14 days in juvenile detention, how can a, a parent be armed or equipped to, to face this kind of situation in the moment when, when you just don't know what the truth is? Well, I mean, I think that you need to do, a parent would need to do exactly what Leslie Ann did. Uh, she did cooperate. Uh, she allowed the officers in her home. Um, she provided the officers with the tablet that allegedly was, was being used. So they did everything in their control and in their power to make sure that they assisted uh, and did not inhibit any type of investigation. But unfortunately, it wasn't enough. You know, these are individuals, this is the first time that Nia's ever had any experience like this, and her mother as well. And as, as you heard Leslie Ann said, that if she did something wrong, then there, there has to be consequences. But what she did not understand was that Nia had done nothing wrong. And this is a very unfortunate situation where the powers that be, you know, jumped to judgment uh, and did not do the proper investigation before locking a little girl up for 14 days. And Leslie Ann, the, the police say that Nia has been exonerated, but for you, this ordeal is not over. In your lawsuit, you describe Nia as suffering severe and permanent injury. Tell us about that. I remember she called me crying one night after taking someone's chocolate and it was like, they, it, they almost started a fight here. So um, it was very traumatizing for the both of us. And um, it's... It's just, it's, it's just not, I, 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 was, I asked, like, why is it so easy for her to go in and it was widely spread? But then afterwards, we did, it was merely a, oh, I'm sorry, that's it. Like, nobody looked into what, what damage it did emotionally, mentally, you know? And there, she's still growing. She's young and she's growing. So um, as adults, you know, a lot of things in our past affect us, and I think it's something that will affect her. What do you hope will come as a result of the lawsuit? And what changes do you want to see for other girls like Nia? 
very shocking to see the, um, a child being uncuffed or something like that. <laughs> and uh, I just hope that they deal with it uh, in a different way. Um, no child should be put in jail and taken away from um, their family at all. Well, Nia, Leslie Ann Davis, Marwan, we thank you so much for your time and, and talking with us uh, about such a difficult experience. We appreciate it. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you. And still to come, the stunning arrest of an ex-president just weeks after he left office. And the Prince Andrew settlement. What does this mean for the royals going forward? With so much at stake, so much on the line, more Americans turn here than any place else. ABC News, World News Tonight with David Muir. America's number one most watched newscast. Now streaming on ABC News Live. It was a scary time in the 70s. You had multiple bodies showing up in Los Angeles. There were so many murders happening. You had to have a name for it, serial killer. There was a human head in there. This was premeditated evil. We have this clock. This person is going to do this again. It's me against the killer. Who's going to win? We'll see who laughs last. Pat. What came next was unlike anything they had ever seen. Admit it. These days, what you need to know seems to change just about every day. What is it that you really want to know, need to know? To help you not just get through your day, but to make the most of it. Feel smarter. Feel better. Feel happier. Well, how about a third hour of Good Morning America? GMA 3, what you need to know. Now streaming on ABC News Live. It's all about you. I risked my life. I put my family in danger. If I was caught, they would have put a bullet in my head. But it was the right thing to do. It was the only thing to do. Terror plot foiled in Garden City, Kansas. That would have been one of the most deadly acts of domestic terrorism ever in the United States. It would have been Oklahoma City. He put his family, himself, in jeopardy for us. Take America's number one news with you anywhere you go, anytime, free. Download the ABC News app now. Breaking news, exclusives, 24-7. There for you with one touch. The ABC News app. Download it now. This is what being live is all about. This is ABC News Live. All right, we're going to move back. Let's move back. We're surrounded this by people no squeezing into this bomb shelter. Run, urgent delivery, run. Not afraid to go there. So my question, Mr. President, what are you so afraid of? Breaking news, live events. This is the moment. Let's go. Streaming straight to you, anytime, anywhere. You just met one friend right here. You're watching ABC News Live. Thanks for streaming with us. National parks are incredibly safe places. A crime will happen. Hey, my mom. My wife had fallen in really critical condition. At that time, I thought it was just a tragic accident. There's still a lot of questions we need to ask. There were small things that didn't totally add up. This is two lives for Harold that have died now. I was shocked. Something's not right. Welcome back. Britain's Prince Andrew has reached a settlement with a woman claiming that he sexually abused her when she was just a minor. Andrew and Virginia Jufre were introduced by Jeffrey Epstein. Here's ABC's Ariel Reshef with what Prince Andrew is now saying about Epstein. Tonight, that stunning about face from Prince Andrew settling out of court for an undisclosed amount with his accuser, Virginia Roberts Jufre, after years of denying her claims against him. Jufre, now 38, says Jeffrey Epstein and Glenn Maxwell trafficked her for sex with the prince on multiple occasions, starting when she was just 17. In a letter to the court filed by both sides, Andrew now saying he has never intended to malign Ms. Jufre's character and he accepts that she has suffered both as an established victim of abuse and as a result of unfair public attacks. The Queen's son also acknowledging it is known that Jeffrey Epstein trafficked countless young girls over many years and saying he regrets his association with Epstein. Do you remember her? No. A stark contrast from his disastrous interview with the BBC in 2019. Do you regret the whole friendship with Epstein? <laughs> um, I, now, I, I still not. And the reason being is that, that the, 
the people that I met um, and the opportunities that I was given to learn, um, either by him or because of him, were actually very useful. And while he does not admit to or deny ever assaulting or even meeting Jufre, he commends the bravery of Miss Jufre and other survivors in standing up for themselves and others. Prince Andrew may have agreed to settle the sexual assault lawsuit, but there are still many questions of what happened and how it's impacting the most famous family on the planet. Robert Jobson, ABC News contributor, joins us now. Robert, thanks so much for joining us. So Prince Andrew was set to sit for a deposition next month in which he would have been questioned under oath. What kind of message is Prince Andrew sending by settling this lawsuit instead of letting it go to trial? Well, a lot of people over here in the UK are sort of suggesting that if you've got enough money, you can get away with something, and that's how it's been interpreted. Unfortunately for him, it certainly hasn't let him off the hook. It's certainly not necessarily improved his reputation in any way. He's admitted to nothing. He's admitted to nothing, but by paying a substantial amount of money to Virginia Gouffray's uh, charity, um, there's people here, it's been suggested that that says an awful lot about the situation. I don't think he had much choice because the deposition that was coming up could have been even more excruciating than that appalling television interview he gave when a lot of, lot of people just gave up on him after that. And what does the settlement, though, mean for the royal family, the prestige of the family? Well, I think it's been tarnished. There's no doubt about that. Um, the, the fact is, this year, though, the Queen's... Uh, Platinum Jubilee, 70 years on the throne. I think the royal family, led essentially by the Prince of Wales, decided that this is enough was enough. They wanted to make a, um, a break from this drip trip story that had been going on for months and months and months, and that they, it was damaging the reputation of the of the institution, of the monarchy, and the family itself. So, yeah. but I must admit, I don't think it's necessarily improved the reputation of either the Prince of uh, uh, Prince Andrew or the monarchy itself because a lot of people are saying that this hasn't really resolved anything. It hasn't proved one way or the other uh, what went on. And you use that word tarnish. Of course, this case has significantly tarnished Andrew's image. He stepped back from royal duties back in 2019. How has this impacted his own personal public standing? I think his public standing was an all-time low anyway and quite recently when the royal family took the decision to take away his royal patronages and his military associations effectively take away his hrh so that he was a private citizen and there wasn't really much more that could be done to him in terms of you know in terms of his, his reputation it was on the floor um at least and this now will mean that he can quietly behind the scenes try to rebuild that by doing whatever work he wants to do but personally i think that the royal family with this man now in his 60s and the royal family looking to slim down once the Prince of Wales becomes king, I don't think there's any way back for him into public life. And this civil suit is linked, of course, to some of the disturbing allegations against Jeffrey Epstein. Have we learned anything new about Andrew's relationship with him? The only thing is, on this particular time, he has actually apologised for his association with Epstein. He didn't do that to start with. Well, of course, the big, the big issue here has always been that, you know, Epstein convicted... Uh, uh, Pedophile. We've had his relationship with Jelaine Maxwell, who, of course, uh, was convicted. Although she's appealing in the case in the sex trafficking case, his judgment is clearly flawed. I mean, these are people that he associated with, was friends with, he invited to the palace, um, and I think that really people are saying that on whatever way you look at this, even if Prince Andrew is not admitting any liability or any guilt here, his his judgment is certainly called into question, and I can't see any charities or, or anybody linked with the royal family wanting to have him in any way associated with their with their organizations and the big burning question of course the royal family gets paid partially by public money do we know where the money for this settlement is coming from we don't and it's not being they're not even saying how much the settlement ha is or there's there's discussions over here that it's in the region of say 10 million dollars um, i suspect it'd be less than that, actually. I mean, the Virginia Gouffray's had in the region of around about $7 million in payouts, according to some sources, including the half a million dollars she got from Epstein way back in, 2000, in the 2009 or so. So, um, will it be public money? I very much doubt it. The, the, we understand that the, the Duke of York has been selling a, a, a $30 million 
uh, ski chalet in, in Switzerland, and that is in the process of going through. Um, but the royal family are, are a rich family, and I'm sure the money has been found and prepared for uh, ahead of this uh, payout. Is that something, though, that people there are complaining about, saying, look, this is just British taxpayer money that's being used? I mean, it won't be. It won't be taxpayer money. It'll be private money, either loaned to him by the Queen until he's made the sale of that property, or from other sources. But it won't be. It will not be linked to public money. Robert Johnson, we thank you so much for your insight and time, as always. Thank you. We are tracking several headlines around the world. A complete fall from grace for the former Honduran president, Juan Orlando Hernandez, who just three weeks after leaving power was arrested and shackled outside of his home. Hernandez's detention comes after a Honduran judge ordered his arrest amid an extradition request by the United States on drug trafficking and weapons charges. Washington's request for extradition is in contrast to a period when the U.S. government saw Hernandez as a vital ally in the region. Hernandez must appear before the judge within 24 hours. Uproar in the Canadian Parliament today as Conservatives blasted Prime Minister Trudeau after he invoked emergency powers to stop the trucker COVID protests. Critics say Trudeau is setting a dangerous precedent by turning to the Emergency Powers Act during peacetime. Protesters in Ottawa have vowed to defy the order. With their colorful feathers perked up and their golden beaks shining, chickens in the Libyan town of Tripoli are competing in the country's first ever beauty pageant. Yes, you heard that right, a chicken beauty pageant. The criteria for the competition is strict, as the animals are judged by their color, the shape and shine of their feathers, and chickens' overall size. The first place winner was a black and white chicken who was praised for its bright yellow feet and hefty size. But beyond beauty, the bizarre competition also hopes to redirect the youth's interest toward something else other than the conflict ongoing in the country. And still to come, meet the tallest teenager in the world when we come back. It was an extraordinary story. A computer salesman was supposed to report to prison to begin a 17-year sentence. They let him turn himself into jail with no escort. No one thought he would run. How do you evade capture for 25 years? How do you do that? Now, join the search, following the U.S. Marshals as they uncover new leads in a global manhunt. Can you help catch this fugitive? Have you seen this man? Have you seen this man? Have you seen this man? Listen and join the all-new hunt wherever you get your podcasts. It was a scary time. In the 70s, you had multiple bodies showing up in Los Angeles. There were so many murders happening. You had to have a name for it. Serial killer. There was a human head in there. This was premeditated evil. We have this clock. This person is going to do this again. It's me against the killer. Who's going to win? We'll see who laughs last. Pat. What came next was unlike anything they had ever seen. This is what being live is all about. This is ABC News Live. All right, we're gonna move back. Let's move back. We're surrounded this by people no squeezing into this bomb shelter. We're on urgent delivery run. Not afraid to go there. So my question, Mr. President, what are you so afraid of? Breaking news, live events. This is the moment. Lift off. <laughs> Streaming straight to you, anytime, anywhere. You just met one friend right here. You're watching ABC News Live. Thanks for streaming with us. Back now with this dramatic incident in California. Cyclists participating in a gravel race over the weekend in the Central Valley got a little more than they'd bargained for. A territorial bull found its way into the middle of the path and began charging at cyclists. Apparently, the bull charged at three separate riders, but everyone is expected to be okay after some tense moments there. Finally tonight, we want to introduce you to the tallest teenager in the world. Reporter Kyle Berger from WFTS in Tampa Bay has tonight's local lowdown. IMG basketball player Olivier Ryu always seems to be the center of attention. It's not something you can hide from. You You can't put on a hat and not be 7'5 anymore. You heard right. Ali is 7'5", and at 15 years old, he stands as the tallest teenager in the world, according to the Guinness World Records. Uh, my mom is 6'2", and my dad is 6'8". Height runs in the Canadian big man's family. Here's his size 20 shoe next to my humble size 10. When I was 10, 11, 12, I started going, and it was getting fast, because, like, every week I was, like, 
getting I yeah, I was like taller than every kids in my school. At seven foot five, Ollie is a giant on the basketball court, and of course, that has its advantages. Ollie is not just big, he's talented. He's a phenomenal passer. He can shoot the three and finish at the rim. First year head coach Jeremy Schiller's goal is to maximize his potential. The biggest thing when you say when you first meet him, you know, you're concerned is, can, is he skilled? Can he move? What's his motor like? Does he like basketball? Those are the things you're nervous about when you're meeting a 7'5 kid and starting to work with him. And the first thing is he loves basketball. So that, that's huge because uh, some kids are just tall and people make them do it. Ryu is proof that embracing what makes you unique can help you reach new heights. Just so effortlessly shoots the ball in there. Our thanks to Kyle Berger for that. And that is our show for tonight. Be sure to stay tuned to ABC News Live for more context and analysis of the day's top stories. I'm Lindsay Davis. Thank you so much for streaming with us. Have a great night. This is what being live is all about.